In this video, we will be discussing Jacksonian democracy, the ascendancy of Andrew Jackson and the Democratic Party after 1828. We will tackle the democratic reforms of the age, in addition to the issue of slavery and the subjugation of Native Americans. The election of Jackson is known as the Revolution of 1828 because Jackson was the first president from the West and a representative of the common man. It was his heroics at the Battle of New Orleans that won him fame, and his presidency represents a shift in ideology. The growing trend throughout the era of good feelings in the age of Jackson was the expansion of democracy. In most states, poor white male citizens were underrepresented in government, since voting required property ownership or tax paying. From 1820 to 1850, all states either limited or abolished property requirements. Presidential electors were now selected by the people. Look at the chart. As you can see, voter turnout increased dramatically under Jackson and his successors. French sociologist and political theorist Alexis de Tocqueville traveled to the United States in 1831 to study its prisons and returned with a wealth of broader observations that he included in his book Democracy in America. As his book revealed, Tocqueville believed that equality was the great political and social idea of his era, and he thought the United States offered the most advanced example of equality in action. He admired, admired American individualism, but warned that a society of individuals lacked the social structures, such as those provided by traditional hierarchies, to mediate relations with the state. The result could be a democratic tyranny of the majority, in which individual rights were compromised. The Whigs were an opposition party formed to challenge Jacksonian Democrats, thereby launching the second party system in America, but they were far from a single issue party. Their ranks included members of the anti-Masonic party and Democrats who were unhappy with the leadership of President Andrew Jackson. Their base combined evangelical Protestants interested in moral reform, abolitionists, and those against the harsh treatment of Native Americans under Andrew Jackson in his rush to expand the country's borders. Whigs were united in their support of the Second Bank of the United States and vocal opponents of Jackson's propensity for ignoring Supreme Court decisions and challenging the Constitution. Jackson, the president of the common man, wanted to replace office holders who had been in place for generations. To do this, he used the spoils system. After winning the 1828 election, he gave government civil service jobs to his supporters, friends, and relatives as a reward for working towards his victory. It was also an incentive to keep them working for the party. Jackson had been promised government positions during the campaign, and 919 officials were removed from their government positions so he could put his supporters in those jobs. Martin Van Buren was a Jacksonian Democrat and founder of the Democratic Party. He quickly rose up the ranks of government. He was elected governor of New York in 1828, appointed Secretary of State by, in 1829 by Jackson. Van Buren was a prominent member of, the, of Jackson's kitchen cabinet, his inner circle of allies. In 1832, he was nominated as Jackson's vice president, replacing John C. Calhoun, who was falling out of favor with Jackson as a result of the Peggy Eaton affair and the issue of nullification. The Tariff of 1828 was a protective tariff passed by Congress to protect industry in the North. It set a 38% tax on imported goods and a 45% tax on certain imported raw materials. South Carolina believed that this tariff was responsible for the state's stagnating economy. They disliked paying more for goods imported from Europe. The reduction in British goods coming to the U.S. made it difficult for the British to pay for cotton produced in southern states. Citing the argument of nullification from the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions and the Tenth Amendment, John C. Calhoun argued that the states can determine the constitutionality of federal laws. In 1832, Congress passed an additional tariff. In response, South Carolina adopted the Ordinance of Nullification, nullifying both tariffs passed by Congress. They also began military preparations to resist the federal government. Congress then passed the Force Bill, authorizing Jackson to use military forces against South Carolina. Congress also passed a Compromise Tariff, which satisfied South Carolina, who repealed their ordinance. This didn't fully resolve the state's rights issue, however. Signed into law in May of 1830 by President Jackson, the Indian Removal Act gave him the power to negotiate for the removal of Southern American Indian tribes to federal territory west of the Mississippi River. The act was strongly supported in the South, especially in Georgia. 
Jackson believed that the only way to humanely preserve the Indians was through relocation, as he thought that they would eventually die out as the Indians of the Northeast had. In 1828, the Cherokee Nation sought an injunction to prevent laws passed by the state of Georgia depriving them of their rights. The Supreme Court refused to hear the case because it doesn't have original jurisdiction. It can only hear appeals. A few years later, in the case Worcester v. Georgia, Sam Worcester was a missionary to the Cherokee and was convicted of violating a Georgia law that didn't allow whites on Indian lands. The Supreme Court had to answer the question, does the state of Georgia have the authority to regulate the interaction between citizens of its state and members of the Cherokee Nation? The Supreme Court ruled in 1830 that the 1830 Georgia law was unconstitutional because it interfered with the federal government's authority. The laws of Georgia have no force on the Cherokee Nation. The Worcester case is an important one, not for just the facts, but for the conclusion. The decision lays out the relationship between the federal government and the state governments in regard to Indi American Indian tribes. The Marshall Court establishes the precedent that Indian tribes are distinct communities that exist outside the state and therefore are not subject to state laws. President Jackson refused to enforce the court's decision, allowing states to pass additional laws that damaged Indian tribes. Following the passage of the Indian Removal Act, the federal government began a series of forced relocations of over 60,000 American Indians from their ancestral homelands to Indian territory west of the Mississippi River. Along the route, people suffered from exposure, disease, and starvation. Approximately 4,000 died before they reached their destination. Tribes relocated included Cherokee, Muscogee, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Choctaw. This is known as the Trail of Tears. The Bank War was the name given to the campaign begun by President Andrew Jackson in 1833 to destroy the Second Bank of the United States after his re-election convinced him that his opposition to the bank had won national support. Jackson announced that, effective October 1, 1833, federal funds would no longer be deposited in the Bank of the United States. Instead, he began placing them in various state banks. By the end of 1833, 23 pet banks, as they were popularly known, had been selected. The president of the bank, Nicholas Biddle, started presenting state bank notes for redemption calling in loans, and generally contracting credit. A financial crisis, he thought, would exaggerate the need for a central bank, ensuring support for a charter renewal in 1836. In fact, Biddle's campaign appears to have had less effect than either his supporters or his detractors believed at the time, but the bank war became a matter of intense debate in Congress, in the press, and among the public. Businessmen descended on Washington, complaining about conditions and seeking an end to the bank war, while administration spokesmen argued that Biddle's capacity to disrupt the economy only highlighted the dangers of a central bank. The federal deposits were not returned to the second bank, and its charter expired in 1836. President Jackson had won the bank war. Roger Taney served as the fifth Chief Justice of the Supreme Court from 1836 to 1864. He was an advocate of Jacksonian democracy. The Taney Court did not strongly break from the precedents of the Marshall Court. Taney is best known for the Dred Scott decision, which ruled that African Americans could not be citizens. Taney Court decisions regarding economic issues and separation of power set important precedents, and the Court's ability to adapt regulatory law during its time of technological and economic progress was significant. The majority opinion in the Charles River Bridge v. Warren Bridge case signaled the court's shift towards states' rights and away from the nationalism of the Marshall Court. In 1785, the Massachusetts legislature incorporated the Charles River Bridge Company to construct a bridge and collect tolls. In 1828, the legislature established the Warren Bridge Company to build a free bridge nearby. Unsurprisingly, the new bridge deprived the old one of traffic and tolls. The Charles River Bridge Company filed suit, claiming the legislature had defaulted on its initial contract. In a 5-2 decision, the court held that the state had not entered a contract that prohibited the construction of another bridge on the river at a later date. The court held that the legislature neither gave exclusive control over the waters of the river, nor invaded corporate privilege by interfering with the company's profit-making ability. In balancing the rights of private property against the need for economic development, 
the court found that the community interest in creating new channels of travel and trade had priority. Henry Clay created an integrated economic program called the American System. This envisioned a protective tariff, a national bank jointly owned by private stockholders and the federal government, and federal support for transportation product, projects for internal improvements. Public lands in the West were to be sold rather than given away to homesteaders so the proceeds could be used for education and internal improvements. The program was designed to promote economic development and diversification, reduce dependence on imports, and tie together the different sections of the country. The election of 1836 saw the emergence of the Whig Party as the primary opposition to the Democratic Party. The Whigs ran multiple candidates to try and prevent the Democrats from winning the majority of the electoral vote. Vice President Martin Van Buren took a majority of the popular and electoral vote. The election signaled the continuation of Jacksonian democracy for the next four years. The Whigs won moderate gains in the House, but the Democrats still firmly controlled the House and the Senate. The Panic of 1837 was a financial crisis that caused a major depression that lasted almost 10 years. Profits, prices, and wages dropped while unemployment went up. It was caused mostly by the economic policies of President Jackson, who left office earlier that year. The destruction of the bus led state chartered banks in the West and the South to relax their lending standards, which reduced their cash reserves to unsafe amounts. Jackson also created the Specie Circular of 1836, which required payment for Western government land in gold and silver, not paper money. The purpose was to stop speculation, but instead it caused a real estate price crash since buyers were unable to produce the gold or silver to pay for the land. With lower monetary reserves in the vaults, major banks on the East Coast had to cut back their loans. Here are the effects of the Panic of 1837. It increased the diversification of crops in the South. It also caused some Southern planters to go bankrupt. And overall, it hurt public support for internal improvements. Martin Van Buren was blamed for the crisis. Critics argued that his refusal to intervene made the panic worse. Democrats blamed the bus, which they said funded speculation and caused inflation. Having tried unsuccessfully to become the new Whig Party's only candidate for president in 1836, William Henry Harrison became the party's official nominee for president in 1840. To attract support in the South, former Virginia Senator John Tyler was named the Whig nominee for vice president. The Whig strategy was to win the election by avoiding discussion of difficult national issues such as slavery or the National Bank. Harrison was the first president to campaign actively for office. He did so with the slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler II. Tippecanoe re referred to Harrison's military defeat of a group of Shawnee Indians at a river in Ohio called Tippecanoe in 1811. Whigs, eager to deliver what the public wanted, took advantage of this and declared that Harrison was the log cabin and hard cider candidate, a man of the common people from the rough and tumble West. They depicted Harrison's opponent, President Martin Van Buren, as a wealthy snob who was out of touch with the people. But the election was during the worst economic depression to date, and voters blamed Van Buren, seeing him as unsympathetic to struggling citizens. Harrison campaigned vigorously and won. After giving the longest inaugural speech, about an hour and 45 minutes, in U.S. history, Harrison only served for one month as president before dying of pneumonia on April 4, 1841.